Welcome to Herbal Hour, the podcast for herbalists, healers, and all things holistic. In this episode, we delve into homeopathic philosophy and how we can apply this holistic way of thinking to healing with herbs. We dive into the mysterious waters of bioenergetics, metaphysical medicine, and homeopathy. We have with us author of Beyond Health, a book that explores the psychological and metaphysical aspects of health, and writer of an honorably mentioned article in Naturopathic Doctor News and Review, my friend and fellow naturopathic student, Jared Pistoy. That's me. I'm here. Drinking tea. Absolutely. And today, we're drinking Thai tea. We're actually drinking uh, several different kinds of things here. Yes. (laughs) Indeed. Coffee, tea. Teas, yep. Absolutely delicious. <laughs> this tea is actually from Thailand. It's good. It's it's definitely very strong. Yes, I'm I'm probably steeped it for too long. It has like a blood, like a ruddy brown color. It's pretty bitter, mm. but it's still good. All right. So, can you tell us a little bit about your book, Beyond Health? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, Beyond Health is um, essentially a culmination of what I started like many years ago, and probably. I first started writing when I was probably like 14. I just started writing down a lot of these insights that I was having about emotions. I was kind of going through a lot at that time, like my family and such, and I was just trying to figure out sort of how to manage my own emotions and um, and just like where to place all the things that were happening in my life. So it started, really it started back then, and I originally um, was going to release an audio book But on the advice of Alex Hine, who was on your first episode, Mm -hmm. uh, he was just like, yeah, you should probably just write a book and then you can can do an audio recording afterwards. I was like, oh, it's a really good idea. So I just wound up taking my script and essentially expanding on a lot of the key areas and just writing chapters and an outline. And uh, so the book turned out to be a, a multifaceted or what we might refer to as a holistic approach to health. Uh, it explores some of the history and present day issues with healthcare in America, and also issues with our understanding of health just as individuals. Usually if you ask someone what is health, they have, really they can't give you a succinct definition. Um, and, and there's reasons for that obviously, health is individualized. Uh, but the, the book is predominantly solutions focused and really seeks to impart to the reader a thorough individualized understanding of health. and which will allow them to begin embracing a healthier lifestyle. So there's also an activity-based guide in part two to help the reader identify and overcome key obstacles that are restricting their health right now. And that starts to me with identifying what your values are. So Mm. there's a couple of key things out of the book that I want to bring up with you. One of them is the way that I define health is very simple. It's balance and self-improvement. And so... If you have those, if you can understand those two concepts, you can essentially apply them to everything else in your life. So, you know, balance in all aspects, um, whether it's your relationships, the food that you're eating, the amount of exercise that you're doing, and self-improvement in terms of, I speak to it more as a, um, a process of habitual decision-making that's going to stimulate your, your healing and also foster your growth as a person. Mm-hmm. And so I think if you put those two things together, you have a, a definition of health that you can apply toward um, just your everyday activities and not get caught up in all like the little different, um, you know, definitions of health and the little, um, all the little, um, what are they called? Like general strategies and, and different things to try to employ health. It's more just like, you know, people, when they think of health, they think of diet and exercise mm-hmm. and they think diet, okay, well, there's the paleo diet, there's the keto diet, there's the Atkins diet. And these are all just subdivisions of, um, these are all diets that have specific applications, but it doesn't really help anybody understand how to pursue health, you know? Absolutely. I mean, every, every month there's a new fad diet. There's a new, this is the supplement to take. There's a new, you should eat this super fruit. Mm -hmm. Um, and what it seems is that everyone knows what they need to do to be healthy. So why are people not healthy? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. I think partly the reason is that we actually don't know how to be healthy, that common knowledge about health is not necessarily applicable to everybody. It takes a little bit more of a specialized approach. And that's why the field that 
uh, we're studying naturopathic medicine, I think is so powerful in this uh, coming generation is because we're, we're training to answer this question for ourselves and our patients. Mm -hmm. So I like to give the example of when it comes to understanding health and understanding the individual nature of it, because it's individual, there's things that are not going to work for some people that are going to work for other people. That's why there's so much contention. People mm -hmm. are expecting that the same things are, that work for somebody else are going to work for them, mm -hmm. whether it's a supplement, whether it's a drug, whether it's an exercise protocol, whether it's a manner of speaking, a manner of walking. These are all things that, are going to, that require you to sort of acquire more knowledge about yourself so that you can understand what works best for you. I think that's a major element of health, and that falls for me into the category of self-improvement. It's self-awareness and respecting yourself enough to be able to gain that, allow yourself to gain that self-awareness. Mm. And even to look at disease or illness as your teacher to bring you um, more into self-awareness. Mm. Uh, and that's a huge concept in anthroposophic medicine where disease is kind of viewed as a teacher. Mm -hmm. And the idea is to help you grow into spiritual awareness. Because if you think about disease, or let's just say you have a toothache, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're going about your day and you're not doing anything or you're at work or something like that. And then all of a sudden your tooth starts to hurt. Now your consciousness goes to your tooth, the pain of your teeth. Mm -hmm. But before that, it wasn't there because you didn't have pain. So now you have this awareness that's, that's being brought or called upon into your tooth. Mm -hmm. And so you become aware of this problem. And then if you have the courage, you say, why do I have this problem? And then if you're even more courageous, you can find an answer which may take you years, it may take mm -hmm. you weeks, it could take you days. But once you find it, you say, okay, I have this tooth problem because I'm eating too much sugar or something like that. Mm. And so you understand that um, what you're doing is contributing to the health of your body. And so, and, but you may be able to eat, you know, a pound of sugar a week and be fine. Whereas me, if I eat, you know, a little bit, I may get a toothache. So, and then, you know, it's like, oh, well, he can eat a pound of sugar and I can only eat you know, a tablespoon of sugar, like, why is he, why can he eat that? You know, mm -hmm. it's because everyone's different, you know, and, and that's the understanding. I think that, um, self-awareness and self-improvement will bring to you. Right. That's at the root of holistic health is looking at the individual and not the statistic. Mm -hmm. Uh, something I was speaking with Alexander Hine about is the fact that people have a story right, that they tell themselves. And the toothache story can become almost a self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. where, yes, it brings your attention to it, so it gives you the opportunity to heal. But then sometimes we have a tendency to hold on to that story and it becomes an identity. Mm. And that's when it crystallizes and becomes this chronic illness of toothache when it was really just a signal from your body, hey, pay me some attention in this area. But now it's become an identity, uh, something people are even proud of in some aspects. Right. And to speak to that, because I have some good thoughts on that. Um, in naturopathy, there's, you know, we learned in the earlier days where we were taught philosophy that mm. diseases are not entities, mm -hmm. meaning that they're not this independent thing that's foreign to the body. But in my opinion, a disease can become an identity or can become an entity mm -hmm. When you attach it to your identity mm -hmm. and so what, what does that look like essentially a good way to look at it is it's more so people who have chronic diseases what they tend to do is they never really get into the lesson of the disease and so they kind of like i have this disease i have this disease and just by saying i have this disease they're basically saying i am this disease mm -hmm. and when you say that you attach your identity to that disease and it becomes a part of who you are and so people can become resistant to treatments or uh, modifying their life, which could potentially cure their disease because it's so attached to them. It's like they have to give up a part of their life now. And so that's very difficult, even when you don't have a disease, just to look back, like if you're in a relationship and you've been in it for you know three, four years mm -hmm. and you're with this person and you've loved them all, those, all that time, but now things are starting to go sour and you know that things are starting to go sour but you don't want to let it go because it's such a part of you. You're, you spent all this time with that person. Mm -hmm. You've become uh, maybe a better or a worse person as a result. And you're unwilling to let it go because it's difficult. Mm. It's Even if it's change. harming you. Exactly. Like yeah. a bad habit or a disease that yep. we're, we would rather hold on to than 
face the unknown of what we would be like without it. That's exactly it. It's, it's fear of losing what you know. Mm. I think that holds people back so much because we, we all tend to get stuck in comfort zones. That's the big thing. We like to stay within our comfortable boundaries, whether it's with the same person, with the same job, with the same foods. And that's why I say it takes a lot of courage to be able to step outside the comfort zone and then even more courage to keep going in that direction. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what the book is, is to help people do is to get out of that comfort zone, to help them look at their lives and say, yes, like I need to do this. And just even buying the book is a first step towards saying, I need to do this. Mm -hmm. So that's, those are some of the key elements of the book. When can we expect to see this book and uh, how can our audience uh, find it for themselves? Yeah, I'm thinking third quarter of 2020 is the targeted release. So essentially either when I'm graduating or immediately after. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll probably wind up selling it on Amazon, I think is the best thing. Sounds good. Do yeah. I get a free signed copy? <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about that. Yeah. I'll, I'll read it and edit it for you. <laughs> yeah. If you, I would if you, actually be interested in reading it. Yeah, man, of course. I could definitely get you a copy. Okay, so let's get into the topic for today. So the question that we are asking that we'd like to answer in this dialectical conversation is, how can the philosophy of homeopathy be applied to using medicinal herbs? So typically, homeopathy is thought of as being certain kinds of preparations, like the little sugar pellets under the tongue or droplets. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the philosophy of homeopathy is? Yeah, so homeopathy is actually pretty old. It was invented by it was invented by Samuel Hahnemann. The guy invented this medicine, you know, just through I don't know observation and just years of study. You know, it's it's kind of interesting to think about someone mm -hmm. inventing a medicine. Mm -hmm. But it's it's more so a philosophy than anything else, a way of treating. So it's the two core concepts to homeopathy as a philosophy are the law of similars mm -hmm. and the law of minimum dose. Mm. And the law of similars basically states that substances that will cause a healthy person to get symptoms, you can use that substance to cure a disease that has those symptoms. Mm. So that sounds weird and it sounds like unlikely, but it really depends on the dose. And one of the best things I've ever learned in medicine is that the dose makes the poison. That's Paracelsus. Yeah, exactly. That was Paracelsus. Um, so that's the law of similars. Now, the law of minimum dose is that you want to give a, a dose of a medicine that's required to produce only a scarcely perceptible uh, effect. Mm. So how, how small of a dose can we give you that's going to have an effect that's not going to aggravate you mm -hmm. or not going to aggravate the symptoms that you have? So in other words, um, if we talk about belladonna, which is a deadly nightshade plant, Mm -hmm. um, the a person might complain of these acute and violent attacks mm -hmm. with you know a great congestion of blood and some kind of nerve pain and it's all very sudden these are all characteristic things of belladonna mm -hmm. so the person is in that state that's how they respond to things let's just say it could be anything could be a migraine mm -hmm. it has the characteristic of coming on suddenly and there's a lot of flushing with blood and then it just goes away suddenly and so if you give the if you give the substance belladonna in you know say you chewed the leaves or something, mm -hmm. you it would produce symptoms like that. They mm -hmm. would be united by the fact that they're all acute, they're all sudden, they're all really intense, and so that's what kind of unites belladonna. Um, so now, if a person presents, let's say, with a migraine who has that characteristics, mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, that sounds like belladonna. What you do then is you give a very dilute version of belladonna, which is mm -hmm. essentially what homeopathy is. So. Homeopathy as a philosophy is defined by the law of similars and the law of minimum dose. And homeopathy, as you apply it in practice, mm. follows those concepts. And when it comes to law of minimum dose, we find that you can get effects with people with really dilute doses, you know, to the point where there's no actual physical substance left in the remedy. So, and the way that's done is they'll take the active constituent of the plant, which I think belladonna is the leaves, I'm not really sure. And you make a tincture out of it, so you dilute or you soak it in alcohol, and mm. the alcohol extracts the constituents, and that's called the mother tincture. So that and that's tincture, basically just um, an herbalism tincture. The yep. mother tincture is just what herbalists would use. Exactly. But the homeopath takes it and dilutes it. Yep. Now, why dilute it? So diluting it has an interesting effect. 
Um, so yeah, it's like it gets to the same point as if you if you cut an aspirin in half. Mm-hmm. It's going to have a lesser or diminished effect essentially. So what happens if you keep cutting the aspirin in half? You're not going to notice any effects of the aspirin, which is a drug, because a drug is designed to have an effect in a higher dose. Mm-hmm. So when you dilute something, what you're essentially doing is uh, preserving the energetics of the plant. And what that means is uh, if you look at how a plant grows or uh, how a plant responds to the environment um, and just generally how the plant is um, adapting to the world, this is kind of an energetic expression of it. So as you go more dilute with medicines, you retain more of the energetic component of it and less of the physical component of it. So with belladonna, for example, a mother tincture of belladonna is essentially just poison because you can't take belladonna because if you take the physical substance, you're going to get those acute violent attacks Mm -hmm. and you're going to get the pupil dilation and you're going to get essentially um, your body's unable to get rid of that poison. So, but if you just keep diluting it, you preserve the energetic expression of it, which is the heat, which is all the symptoms that I just said, but they don't cause them to the same intensity. So what it does, how, how it works physiologically is it stimulates the body to sort of recognize that pattern and mm-hmm. eliminate it. Mm-hmm. And so there's another print, there's another law, I don't remember what it's called, but um, essentially it's like the concept of sound. If mm-hmm. you take two sound waves that are the same exact sound wave and you aim them at each other, they cancel out. Is that interference, maybe? It's not interference because in interference, the sound waves are different. Mm -hmm. So you have one sound wave, it's on some frequency, and another one that's on maybe a higher frequency. So they're they're having some kind of communication that we hear as interference. Mm -hmm. Um, If you think about mathematics, when when you combine two waves that are, one of them is, let's say, like it, it's a positive, so it goes up. Let's mm-hmm. say it goes up to one on a chart. And you do the same thing with another one that goes down to one on a chart, mm-hmm. the sum is zero. They, they cancel, cancel each, each other, other out. out. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's the same concept as homeopathy. Mm-hmm. You give one message that's, mm-hmm. or the patient has one message that is this acute violent attacks. That's the energetic of it. Then you have another message coming from the dilute version of it. That's sort of the opposite of it. Because on the one hand, you have a physical, physiological expression of it in the physical world, Mm -hmm. on the other hand, you have a spiritual or an energetic expression of it. Those two things are essentially opposite. So a good way to look at this is is by applying anthroposophic philosophy, Mm -hmm. which essentially asserts that there are four different bodies. So we have a physical body, which is connected to the earth, Mm kind of like plants, Mm -hmm. minerals, and things like that. And we have the skeleton, muscles. Yeah, the all physical. the physical aspects of the body. When we study anatomy and physiology, mostly exactly. anatomy, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mostly anatomy, exactly. But yeah. physiology as well, and that speaks more to the etheric forces, which are the these formative healing forces. Mm-hmm. So the forces that are most predominant when you are asleep. Those mm-hmm. are the, so those two bodies, physical and etheric, are actually connected. So they're like one one body. Mm-hmm. That's sort of the base of human. Um, physical nature is those Mm -hmm. two bodies then you have these two things that can't be seen which are the astral body or the soul body Mm -hmm. which is more of like a gaseous kind of a thing it's related to our emotions like someone says that like oh yeah this guy's got a lot of soul you know Mm -hmm. or blues is like has a lot of soul bad vibes good vibes yeah emotional connection emotional Mm -hmm. stimulation then there's a spirit or an ego which is the highest force that we have and it's so the astral soul and spirit ego are connected as a, as a body as well. So you mm. have physical etheric, which is one body that's sort of rising up from the ground. Then you have astral soul and spirit ego. That's another body. And that's sort of pushing down. So you have this polarity of forces that's similar to yin yang. Mm-hmm. And um, so how does this um, anthroposophic theory mm-hmm. of the four bodies how does this relate to how you use homeopathy to treat someone? So anthroposophic medicine provides a better basis of understanding how to apply homeopathy because it's more broad in what it encompasses. I mean, anthroposophic medicine is very holistic. It, in- mm-hmm. it includes almost everything you can think of that contributes to human health. So those two forces in particular, when they're out of balance, that's when you have uh, symptoms. So in other words, if your physical etheric forces are weak, 
and you have a, uh, a hyperactive astral soul spirit ego, you get an imbalance of forces. And so with homeopathy, it comes back to that physical structural body that you have that's expressing the symptom. And then you have the energetic medicine that's working more on the astral spirit planes that's combating that. So what homeopathy does is it balances out the system, ideally anyway. Mm-hmm. Easier said than done, but that's the whole idea with it. Mm. So they say that homeopathy is like the cousin of anthroposophic medicine. Interesting. Yeah. So how does, you said something that the more dilute it is, mm-hmm. the more it has its energetic properties. Mm-hmm. How, how does diluting something make it more energetically effective and how is it more related to those more non-perceivable bodies like the etheric and the astral gotcha there's a couple of different concepts that should be explored in order to explain that Mm -hmm. and the first one is the concept of hormesis Mm -hmm. which was actually developed by these two guys uh, i don't know their first names but they they were both pharmacists so they had nothing to do with homeopathy um, and they invented this law, which we know today as hormesis. It's mm-hmm. called the Arndt Schultz law. Mm-hmm. And what these two guys observed is that there's a different physiological response at different doses. And they were using drugs of some sort to measure that. So what they found was that low doses stimulate physiology, mm. whereas a medium dose inhibits physiology and a high dose suppresses physiology. Mm. And so this is what this came from conventional medicine. This didn't come from any of the uh, esoteric physicians. So that was the one thing that they they discovered that laid a foundation for explaining homeopathy. Um, and you even see in conventional medicine, what they have now is called ultra dilutions, which is basically a homeopathic dose. So one example is low dose naltrexone. Mm-hmm. It's a dose that's like 0.0005. That's you know. blowing up recently for things like fibromyalgia, MS, all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Just a quick PubMed search and low-dose naltrexone is pretty amazing. And the fact that it's low-dose and it has different effects at low-dose seems to uh, lay some credence to, to what you're saying right now. It's kind of a weird phenomenon and you know because you have a, a different effect at a higher dose. And then when you go really dilute, you get even a, a even different effect. Mm-hmm. And sometimes a more drastic effect too. Um so that's the one concept that you know conventional medicine looks at and it kind of accepts. Two pharmacists made it, but I don't know if they actually recognize it at this point, but it's kind of beyond the point. Right. So there is uh, that idea exists in herbalism of using low dose herbs. Mm-hmm. For example, uh, Matthew Wood, uh, a pretty prominent herbalist who teaches a lot about traditional Western herbalism. He talks a lot about using, you know, drop doses of a tincture, like putting, you know, 10 uh, 10 drops in a cup of water or something. Mm -hmm. And that's supposed to support more of the physiology. Uh, And then that effect of hormesis, where a low dose has one effect and a high dose has a different effect, Mm -hmm. comes into play. Now, what happens when we start diluting things past the point, past Avogadro's number, Mm -hmm. where it's, you know... um, a chemist would say there's none of that particles there. How can the effects of that medicine be there? Okay, so that, that brings us to the next concept that's involved with how you know diluting a medicine could be effective. Mm-hmm. So our understanding of water right now is actually very limited. Mm-hmm. And we have... So there's this guy, Gerald Pollack, who mm-hmm. did extensive study on water, just water, observing water. And what he found was at particular temperatures and particular scenarios the water water behaves in a way that's not exactly solid or not exactly liquid and so we know that there's three phases of water right Mm -hmm. we have liquid water we have gaseous water or water vapor and we have solid water which is ice so as it turns out there's actually a fourth phase Mm. that lies in between liquid and solid Mm. it's kind of like jello so our understanding of the cell if you think of the cytoplasm, there's this gelatin. It's actually a gelatinous material. Mm. It sounds like it would be right, cytoplasm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so there, so that is water in its fourth phase. It's this gelatinous kind of thing, and it has a very unique property because it creates when you put it next to a, a certain kind of material. 
um, a hydrophilic material or in, in other words a material that's kind of friendly to water and water soluble yeah exactly which is kind of like our arteries mm-hmm. um, the water what it, what it will do it will arrange itself in a particular way mm-hmm. so what happens is the water actually uh, as, as it comes closer to the surface of that material it splits its charges so towards the the, the material, if you get really close to the material, what you see is just all negative charges lined up. And there's nothing else in that zone. So mm. they call it an exclusion zone, mm. where the water will exclude everything else except these negative charges that it contains. And it filters out impurities, it filters out bacteria, it filters out viruses. Nothing else is allowed in that exclusion zone. Mm. And then outside the exclusion zone, you have positive charges. And so... Is this occurring inside uh, arteries and veins? There's no way to truly tell at this point. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we need probably better technology for that. But uh, theoretically, it seems like we're inching closer to looking at uh, the flow of blood by understanding the fourth phase of water, Mm -hmm. which is that the artery itself is also charged like that, where the water, Mm -hmm. the, the, um, the outer membrane of the artery in the lumen, which is on the inside, mm-hmm. has the negative charges and an exclusion zone. So only certain things will communicate with the edge of the artery. And so water is very interesting in that way. And so the other thing with water is that it actually carries, it can be charged by sunlight. Mm-hmm. And what that means is if the water is exposed to light, it just starts absorbing the energy and holding mm-hmm. the energy. And so you can use water to make batteries too, just by putting the the water inside of you know let's just say like a square material and exposing it to some sort of electromagnetic frequency to charge the water what happens is the water will tra- will transmit the charge so it will discharge its energy just like a battery same exact concept you know it's actually uh fascinating a lot of the early alchemical physicians they would charge their medicines in like moonlight yep. or sunlight Paracelsus was big on that, uh, where you would, you know, create some kind of herbal remedy and you would leave it out in the moonlight during a certain, you know, uh, astronomical configuration of the sky. And it was thought to increase the power. Do you think that there's some kind of bioelectric or biomagnetic force at play here that's influencing the medicinal properties of substances? Definitely. I mean, they essentially proved that that statement exactly with with water by showing that you can use it as a battery mm. and and the way that they charged the battery was by exposing it to light and if you they didn't say this in, mm. in Pollock's work but I, I was thinking myself that when you give a plant water plants need water mm. and sunlight right as some foundational things mm-hmm. when you expose a plant to sunlight and you don't water it it gets a little shriveled up right everyone knows that mm-hmm. then when you water it the water allows the plant to sort of um, use uh, the energy from the sun. That's how right. I look at it. It provides a structure for the, the transmission of energy between the sun and the plant. Right. And another interesting thing is how does the plant, let's say, let's use a tree, for example. Mm-hmm. How does a tree, which has no valves, it has no um, way of propelling water upward, how is it possible that it can get all that water from the roots of the tree all the way up to the top leaf? Let's say, mm-hmm. you know, it's a redwood. Grab The gravitational force in order to go anywhere physically you have to be able to overcome that right f equals ma right and they don't have a heart or anything Mm -hmm. that's pumping water so there's no pump yeah so how does how does that happen i actually don't know right so that's interesting right (laughs) it is pretty fascinating so what happens is and this is this has enormous implications and revolutionary implications in my opinion but it's not for some reason it's not receiving that much attention Mm. Pollock's video on YouTube gave a TED Talk, 20-minute TED Talk, only has 818,000 views, and it's been up there for a little while, so... Mm, some cat videos have, like, 300 million views. Yeah, and there's on random topics. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in that video, he also talks about this amazing property of water where, again, if you have a hydrophilic material, let's say you roll it up into a tube, mm-hmm. and you just put it in water, mm-hmm. the water will just start flowing through the tube, and you'll get infinite flow. It goes forever. So they they were only able to observe it for 24 hours because everyone went to sleep. They were <laughs> so it just kept moving. They didn't have any other source of anything. They exposed it to light. That was the energy source. Mm. Sun. I think they used uh, light, like some kind of uh, indoor light. Um, 
but if you put it in sunlight, you'll get the same effect. So the water or the, the water is absorbing the energy from the light and it's responding to it as well mm-hmm. by moving along this hydrophilic tube by orienting its charge. And so you just get um, infinite flow, basically. Mm. So if you think about trees, they must have this hydrophilic material, which is like, I think, xylem or phloem. Do you remember that from biology? Yeah, yeah. These I special so. materials. Mm-hmm that are like the veins and arteries of the of the tree and the only thing that makes sense at this point is that the tree is structured in such a way to allow for this perpetual motion Mm -hmm. and so it's basically free energy from the sun wow yeah interesting right you know what uh fact really blew my mind when i uh, learned it is that almost all of the mass of a tree all of its weight all of its matter doesn't actually come from the ground. It doesn't come from the dirt. It comes from carbon dioxide. Hmm. That's mind blowing. So you have a tree that's, you know, a hundred feet tall or something, 50 feet tall. All of the matter of that tree, all of that physical matter, what we think of as the hard substance of that tree carbon is from the carbons Mm. in carbon dioxide. It's not Mm. like it's pulling the dirt into it. It's from water. Well, water's Mm. fluid. Right, and car- uh, carbon dioxide. So it's taking carbons from air and turning it into physical matter. Mm. If that's not mystical, I don't know what is. There's <laughs> basically this organism that you throw a seed into the dirt, it shoots out by some force, it knows how to do that. And then it gets a little bit of sunlight on it, gets some water, and now it starts taking in basically air and maybe you can say etheric forces or something Mm. and it starts growing its own physical body and becomes self-sustaining it's pretty remarkable that's really interesting Mm -hmm. and anthroposophically you can actually um think about the relationships of so in anthroposophic medicine there is this idea of there's three primary processes occurring Mm -hmm. with all living things Mm -hmm. one of them is a nervous or a sensory component that's taking in energy it's kind of like the um the tree absorbing light, mm-hmm. the, the upper pole of the nervous senses, sensory is the sun. Mm-hmm. And then you can also think about this lower pole of the etheric forces, which are more the physical forces that the plant's drawing up from the earth itself. Like the roots. Exactly, yeah. I remember um, when Dr. Kalnins was uh, teaching us a little bit about anthroposophical medicine, he tied together certain parts of the plant are more associated with certain parts of that body. So mm-hmm. the flowers are associated with um the more nervous forces the flowers you know it's the absorbing the sunlight uh, interacting with the world the beautiful part it's the part that's seen that's where the essential oils tend to be the the part that we touch and are attracted to also right Mm -hmm. Um, and the roots are like the the rooting to um the nutrients and the minerals and the kind of like uh metallic elements of, of hardness and then uh, there's also the, is it the metabolic or the respiratory is the third? There is a, at the metabolic, so the, at the upper pole is the nervous sensory. Mm-hmm. At the lower pole is the metabolic forces. Mm-hmm. So that would be the minerals and such. Mm-hmm. And the middle pole is the rhythmic forces. Right, rhythmic. Yeah. So the breathing, like the, the right. plant taking in carbon dioxide is sort of its rhythmic action of, of breathing. Right. And that's associated with like the leaves of plants, right? Mm-hmm. That's fascinating. I really, I thought that idea was was pretty profound that, you know, you take a certain plant, like we were just talking about nettle, for example, mm-hmm. right? The the leaf is used a lot for bladder uh, issues, kidney stuff. Uh, it's very nutritive, very high in nutrients, vitamins, minerals. It's just overall very building to the mm-hmm. kind of body. Um, it helps a lot with allergies, right? breathing rhythmic is it nutritive if i don't remember it is the okay, leaf yeah. is nutritive yeah so there you go another physical building property mm-hmm. nutrition helping people to add nutrition right nutritive elements I should right say. and it's used for people with like asthma and allergies and things mm-hmm. like that and the rhythmic force is associated with respiration and things like right, that right like asthma is a rhythm right and the nettle root is that's the one that uh it has synergistic effects with soft palmetto. Mm. So they, they act together to kind of build up the male reproductive system and the male hormones and, and this kind of thing. So mm. the roots are more... Metabolic. Yeah. Mm. They're more like that building up like strong uh, strong force. Now... Strong. Very, strong like bull. Strong like bull. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so back to homeopathy, right? Mm-hmm. 
So given that background of information, mm-hmm. first of all, it becomes more clear to us that there's we we know a lot less than we think, mm. and so we're very stuck in our under we're very very again we're very resistant to change mm. and very resistant to um, losing what we know. Mm-hmm. We're very afraid of that, and so but what we see is we have to admit that that we're getting this cutting edge research. Mm-hmm. It's essentially cutting edge research. And it, it exists, but we don't really know what to do with it yet. Right. So my point here is that we should just be a little bit more open-minded to what science is showing us, mm-hmm. you know, and that's how we move forward. So with homeopathy, if water essentially is uh, linked to the etheric forces, I believe. I could be wrong there, but these are building forces. So water actually provides structure in the sense that it's in, in the easy phase, it becomes more gelatinous, which is a structure. And so on the inside of the cell, the, the water is actually structuring itself around these proteins that are in there. Mm-hmm. And so the proteins have information for how the cell is to build itself, what the activities it will carry out. But if you think of proteins, primarily they, they have structural roles in terms of they're telling the cell how to do something and how to build something. It's like proteins for building muscle, right? So... Like enzymes and things like that. Yeah, exactly. The all proteins and reactions and such. The water interacts with that stuff. And so if you put a, um, this is probably just speculation, but if, if you, when water interacts with protein, it takes on a certain structure based on what the protein says. And mm-hmm. that's based on amino acids and such. But the water is actually interacting to provide structure with it. So we think of water, we always think it's a liquid, but it has another phase. It has another property that allows it to provide structure for things. So this is a long-winded answer, but with homeopathics, when you take a remedy with active constituents and, or just say when you take a plant with active constituents Mm -hmm. and you use alcohol to distill the constituents or to extract the constituents, Mm -hmm. you get the mother tincture, right? That's well and good. We all know that. Mm -hmm. When you dilute it, what you're actually doing is you take, you know, 10 or a hundred drops of that mother tincture. I'm sorry, you take one drop of that mother tincture and you put it in either 10 or 100 drops of water, Mm -hmm. depending on what potency you want to make. And then you succuss it or you shake it and you do a vigorous shaking. And what that is thought to do is essentially help the water interact with what's in there. So the the plant material that's in there has constituents, which are, you know, proteins and different kinds of uh, nutrients and such. And they have a physical form. It's just that we can't see it because it's so small. So what it's doing is the water is interacting mm-hmm. with those proteins the same way that it does inside the cell, and it's creating a structured environment. So the water itself doesn't change consistency. It's still liquid, but it's preserving the energetic form of the actual substance, which was, it could be, you know, like, let's just say it's calcium. It's preserving the structure energetically of it. So the idea is that whatever material is in the water, when it's being shaken up, it's almost imprinting the water with some kind of almost like hologram or something that's a great way to look at it it's Mm. like a hologram Mm. and it's it's not physically there but it is Mm. kind of physically there there was an interesting experiment and uh i wish i remembered the name of it but what they basically did is they put uh dna like fully Uh, formed dna you know that one yeah i know go ahead tell that was a good one okay um (laughs) so they basically they put dna in water um you know, fully formed DNA with all that information. Which is protein. Yeah. Then they took all of it out mm-hmm. um, and they put, you know, random fragments of DNA back into the water, like not associated in any way. Basically the building blocks right. of it in different uh, uh, different ways. Uh, they were trying to discover, you know, how does DNA form together? Because that's one of the great mysteries of life is, okay, DNA basically creates everything, but what created DNA? How, how did DNA mm-hmm. form itself to form other things mm-hmm. without a cell? Like, it's completely unfathomable. Yeah, we, we have don't no have, idea. We have no <laughs> idea about that. It's like a mystery, complete mystery. Uh, but it didn't reorganize itself. It was just those fragments. It was just sitting in the water. You put the fragments in. It was just fragments. So, oh. But they found that putting a certain electrical current through the water made uh, made the fragments come together in similar configurations that the previous DNA that was in there was in. Mm-hmm. That's very interesting. So if that, if that experiment really is true, it seems to be saying that there is some kind of imprint left by materials in water 
that if you put other materials in and put some kind of electromagnetic force in, they'll energy. reconstitute basically just themselves. Energy. Which m- might be how, you know, life forms in, uh, in the oceans at earliest time. Because mm-hmm. there's this idea that there was all these like nucleic acids. And when the atmosphere cleared from all the volcanic activity, there mm-hmm. were the water was probably exposed to regular sunlight, Mm -hmm. which was transferring energy into the water. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Have you ever uh, looked into the field of cymatics or chymatics? Uh, Yeah, you told me about it like three years ago, I think. It's so (laughs) mind-blowing. I started watching it. I was was, like bugged out. This is exactly (laughs) what you're talking about. So basically, the principle of it is how do sound waves and vibrations affect matter? Mm -hmm. That's the question that they're uh, trying to solve. And what a very basic experiments with it show us is that when you put sand on top of, you know, some kind of like metallic surface or something and you put it just there in a pile and underneath this metallic plate, you let's say do 440 Hertz or something, 440 cycles per second, Mm -hmm. something like that. It will actually, the sand will rearrange itself and form itself in patterns uh, the geometric patterns right that's like if you put it throw a pebble on the water it has a ripple effect there's a pattern that's associated with the force of the the pebble that's expanding out on the water it's a similar right. concept right now if you change the frequencies you get different geometric patterns mm, but they're consistent cool. patterns so there's kind of this theory that i remember i was really fascinated about the origin of life i still am really fascinated about it but one of the theories that i found particularly interesting was that in the early stages before life was formed, there was essentially all sorts of building blocks of life. Um, and the early atmosphere was incredibly chaotic. There Mm -hmm. was thunderstorm, sulfuric acid rain down. It was just, you know, it was mayhem apparently from what scientists (laughs) understands. Uh, but there was also underwater volcanic eruptions and things. So there was a lot of noise everywhere, rumbling and Mm -hmm. this and that. And the idea is that, somehow certain vibrations or maybe even certain planets that were around uh, created certain vibrations that allowed matter to form itself together in what became, you know, the basic building blocks of life, Hmm. which later became cells and things like that. Hmm. Um, There's also, of course, the the theory that, you know, life came from another planet, which is just pushing the question back farther. It actually doesn't answer the question at all because then like, okay, it came, let's say life came from another galaxy. Okay, well, how did it form in that galaxy? It's actually a stupid answer. It doesn't, Kicking the can down the road. Yeah, it just kicks it to somebody <laughs> else. It's like, you know when you have something that you got to do, uh, something that's due, some work you need to do, some mm-hmm. chore, and you, you say you'll do it tomorrow? Procrastination. You're basically <laughs> pushing it to your later self. You're basically like, F you later self. Mm-hmm. And then when you wake up that day, you're like, oh, <laughs> past Bogdan was such an a-hole <laughs> putting this on me. He knew it would happen. Taking so it's kind of like that. Hole. Yeah. So back to, uh, yeah. So a lot of, a lot know. of unknowns, a lot of unknown factors when it comes, especially when it comes to energetics and, um, you know, how we're actually interacting with the physical world is it's very perplexing. And there's a lot of different variables to consider and, where I, we're only in our, our infancy and in understanding mm. what how everything does interact. And so if you go back to homeopathy, as, it, as it's interacting with water, you're getting the structuring of the water, which mm. is retaining the holographic image of it, essentially. And, and there's some theories that, uh, based on the properties of water, that help to explain it more scientifically. And one of them is called cohesive domain. Mm-hmm. It just refers to how the water uh, relates to itself. So... I, f- I forget what the actual, you know, principle is there, but so the water has a special way of interacting with itself. Let's just keep it at that. So when you keep, so if you put the remedy in, you dilute it, you succuss it, right? Mm. You get the energetic imprint. Then the question becomes, okay, well, why does it get more powerful? Mm. And the reason is mm-hmm. because, and this is my theory that if you're, if you take, okay, so again, the process was take the mother tincture, take one drop of that. And let's just say you put it in 10 drops of water, mm-hmm. you succuss it, right? Then you take one drop of that and you put it into another 10 drops of water. So now you have one 10, you have one of the plant and 10 of the water or nine of the water. And then you do it again. Now you have one out of 100. So it quickly starts. That's to like a up. one C, right? So yeah, essentially. Yep. Um, that's what it is. Mm-hmm. So then 
when you keep, as you keep diluting it, what's happening is, and again, this is my interpretation of how things work. You're giving, you're basically adding more structure to the environment so you can fit more information in the water. So as you keep shaking it and diluting it, the water, remember the water that you're already shaking from the first dilution it already got has the imprints. From exactly. The so now you have substance. all that imprint in there. The substance doesn't matter anymore. You have all the imprints though. So you have the information. Mm. Now you take information, you put it into a, another body of water. Now you have more opportunities for, for the um, imprint of that information. So you get a broader network of communication so between the water. Keep going and you have a vast network because you have so much water. Mm. That That's very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Now, from my understanding, a lot of homeopathic remedies were actually originally derived from plants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. a, good, uh, a good large portion. So that brings us to the question of why use a low dose Mm -hmm. uh, botanical or homeopathic versus a higher dose because uh, one could reason that you know the energy of the plant or the imprint is also in the mother tincture is also in sure. the the full strength uh, alcohol extract of it so why dilute it down if and even adding to that when we drink the tincture aren't we also diluting it into our body that's a good point. You know, I don't really, I can't really speak to that of exactly what's going on when, it, when you take it inside the body. Mm -hmm. But what makes sense is with the mother tincture, yes, you still have spiritual energetic components of it, mm -hmm. but they're not as pronounced because you have more physical matter in there. Mm. So when you take the physical matter out, you leave more room for the spiritual aspect of it. Mm. So um, taking a low dose, you would do it because you want the properties of whatever's in there physically. Mm. So if it's uh, belladonna mm -hmm. or urtica mm -hmm. and let's just say urtica is very nutritive but it's only nutritive in its physical form right without the nutrients it's not nutritive exactly so there's no physical uh, component to it anymore so mm -hmm. you wouldn't use it for that but as you it has different indications when you dilute it more and so that's when you consider more of the holistic uh, aspect of the patient i know mm -hmm. that herbs and homeopathy are both holistic philosophies mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure though, is I know that when you using herbs, you can prescribe based solely on a person's energetic, right? Yeah, absolutely. There is specific energetics based on, uh, actually very similar to the way homeopathics are prescribed where there's like a presentation of, you know, this is a chamomile person or something like that. There's right. that system exists in herbalism as well. Uh, typically those systems, they tend to use lower doses like, you know, 10 drops or something like that in a glass of water but some herbalists use very large doses and they still prescribe within the energetic system mm. uh, personally that's more of my approach i use larger larger doses but i look at it from a holistic and energetic perspective mm. because at least from my understanding herbs in their effects they don't tend to be as pronounced and as suppressive as pharmaceuticals so the body can tolerate very high doses without uh, it having, you know, some kind of overt suppressive effect. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's really a, a good question. So how do we apply this way of thinking homeopathically to herbalism? And I know there's, there's a theory in herbalism um, that there's a primary effect and a secondary effect mm. of uh, an herb. And this is very akin to what you were saying before. Uh, so basically, you take a plant and its primary effect is what it does to the body. So you drink caffeine. Like a drug, same deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Caffeine, its primary effect is, you know, it's a diuretic. It makes you pee. It mm -hmm. makes you energize. So you take the substance, it goes in, and that's mechanical model. It binds these receptors. It does this, and this is the effect. Mm -hmm. The secondary effect is how your body responds to that stress caused by the primary effect. So the secondary effect to caffeine, not really sure what it is, but it's basically whatever your body responds to counterbalance and maintain homeostasis in the face of this external influence, right? So the idea that I've understood from low-dose uh, herbals is that when you're going lower doses, you basically, you can stimulate the secondary effect without getting the primary effect. So you can... Right stimulate the body to respond to an agent without actually causing that damage. So in terms of toxic herbs, so the primary effect of a toxic herb like belladonna is 
essentially nervous system poisoning, you know, yeah. pupils Delirium. dilate, delirious, mm -hmm. et cetera. So the indic so when you give that poison, it's not always lethal. The mm -hmm. body, you know, recovers. It has all these mechanisms that we don't understand for which it um, reestablishes homeostasis. So you give belladonna and it has this secondary reaction to kind of clear the toxin. Now, the idea that I'm seeing is that if you give a very small amount of belladonna, maybe like a drop or maybe even less than that, you bypass the primary uh, effect. So it doesn't actually poison the body, but it almost like tricks the body into responding to as if it was poison. So now it's just having a secondary healing response to something that's not even toxic. Mm -hmm. So now it's just having a response against those symptoms that a primary dose would cause because it's almost trying to reestablish balance. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And it's, you can look at it as you're just giving the body with a, with a higher dose energetic medicine. You're just giving the body information mm. that there is something that there, there's this poison inside of me, which isn't physically there, mm -hmm. but the essence of it is there. And that stimulates the body to respond to that essence and so you could get a primary effect that's negative. That's called an aggravation in homeopathy, mm -hmm. where the person's symptoms temporarily get worse. Now, mm -hmm. that's an interesting notion because you gave a remedy for a certain set of pictures. Let's say it's a migraine again. And, you know, five, ten, half hour, an hour later, a person gets a really bad migraine. It's like one of the worst that they've had. And so and that was because they took a remedy. So the remedy forced the body to produce an effect which intensified the symptoms that the person had. So that's a primary effect. Mm -hmm. And then what you see is with an aggravation, it could last for some unspecified period of time, but it will resolve and the person's migraines will improve significantly to the point where they may not even get them again. Mm. And so it's the same thing as herb, but it's the opposite. It almost, it, it seems to be like you're pushing the body over the edge. You're... It was oh, with not the aggravation. You mean? Yeah, it was not reacting sufficiently to clear this symptom of migraine, whatever's causing it. So you almost gave it a little bit more of that migraine, and now all of a sudden, it's like the body can overcome it. Right, and this is um, saying that, or it's actually more of a concept where mm -hmm. it, you know, where a lot of people are chronically inflamed, chronic mm -hmm. inflammation, mm -hmm. whether it's an MS or whether it's. Um, Essentially, any disease, heart disease is chronic inflammation, diabetes. So this chronic inflammation is essentially unresolved inflammation. Right. The body can't finish its healing reaction as it would if you were, had a common cold, which is acute inflammation. Mm -hmm. So the saying is that the solution to chronic inflammation is acute inflammation. To make it acute. Yeah, and because what that does is it brings the body's healing mechanisms to that area right. or to that system so that it can finally finish the inflammation, which in the first place stopped either because the person wasn't adhering to the principles of health mm. or because they took a drug that cut off the mechanisms that were intended to to get rid of that symptom. So all medicines that are, are from the earth essentially try to stimulate acute inflammation. That's why poisons can help mm. because in the right dose, if you give a poison, it's stimulating acute inflammation by calling the body's immune system over. And to resolve that process. Right. That's it's the like whole idea. how little stresses can lead to adaptations and health. Right. For example, exercising, all it is is you're putting stress on your body. Primary effect is damage. Secondary effect is growth. Regrowth past, past yeah. where it was initially. Exactly. So now you're stronger. stronger. Yep. Like taking cold showers and hydrotherapy or hot saunas mm -hmm. or anything that puts the body under some kind of stress. It, it adapts become stronger and now the original external influence is easily uh, dealt with. And another simple way to look at it is if people who live in really warm climates, they're really in really warm climates and then they come to a place like, you know, that's, let's say they're used to 90 degrees every mm -hmm. day. Then they come to a place that's 60, 70 degrees mm -hmm. and they're freezing mm -hmm. because they're not used to being in that weather where 60, 70 degrees is not really cold. You shouldn't be freezing in that. But because they're accustomed to that 90 degree weather, they're really efficient at handling heat. It's relative. And so after a few months, they're going to be fine with 60 to 70 degrees weather. Then when they go back to 90 degrees, they're going to be hot all day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the body's remarkably mm. adaptable mm. in the way that responds to the environment. I've had that experience before where after I was sick for a few days, I had some kind of flu or cold. When I did recover, I actually felt better than before I got sick. Mm. Almost like when the body presses the, all right, 
the oh crap, let's heal button, mm-hmm. like a lot of other things get handled at the same time that weren't getting resolved. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a big reason for chronic illness is like you were saying, it doesn't have a chance to have that acute response. Uh, for example, certain certain people take you know, an anti-fever medicine every time they get a fever, but the fever is the acute response that is trying to not only heal you of this cold, but it's also trying to heal you of all the things that are going wrong at that time. But if we're always suppressing that response and we're always running around, high cortisol stress also um, suppresses the immune system as a very good survival mechanism. Like you don't want to be like sniffling and coughing and have a fever while, you know, a wild boar is chasing you down the forest. Right. It would be ridiculous. You need, there needs to be a system in the body to suppress the immune system. But right. the issue is that because of the way of life we live, our immune system is always suppressed because we're always sympathetic. We're always go, go, go. No sleep. Um, even when we eat, we're like, do something else while we eat. Mm-hmm. We don't have parasympathetic. When we sleep, you know, pe- people need, you know, ambient CR to fall asleep. They need, you know, a horse tranquilizer basically to knock themselves out because they're so sympathetic all day long that falling asleep becomes an activity. It becomes like a not an activity. Thing. Yeah, it's it a, the absence <laughs> of activity. It's the rest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's um, and interesting about the sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system and the balance is that, again, it's a similar concept as the anthroposophic medicine where you have two forces that are at balance with each other and yin and yang, the same thing. There's always some kind of polar force mm-hmm. in the universe. Um, so when it comes to... Um, I lost my train of thought with this. <laughs> All right. Absolutely no problem. Let's get oh, no, back I, into, I remember. Oh, I remember. There we go. <laughs> so an interesting sidebar is the, I'm reading a book called Human Heart, Cosmic Heart. Mm. Really fantastic book. It's, first of all, it's well-written, which is, I always appreciate. It's, it's like, rare these days. It's rare, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so many bestsellers are just like. Hard to read, too much information, yeah. and it's just annoying. Mm-hmm. But Thomas Cowan's <laughs> the author of that book, mm-hmm. and it looks at, what the function of the heart is, you know, and because all this time we thought the heart was essentially a pump, just pumping blood along. It's another conversation, but the, so it looks at what's the actual cause of heart attacks. Mm -hmm. And we say, okay, people have coronary artery disease. It means that there's a plaque buildup in the arteries that supply the blood to the heart. And so when the artery, the current medical model thinking, the biomedical model is that when the artery becomes too blocked, it restricts blood flow. And the restriction of blood flow to the heart itself causes some kind of what we call ischemia mm-hmm. or a lack of blood supply to an area. So there's not enough oxygen there to keep the cells supplied. Right. And that's what causes chest pain. It's that lack of uh, blood to the heart. It's not uh, something else. Right. That, exactly. That's mm-hmm. the heart's way of saying that it's not okay. Mm-hmm. You know? So, But interestingly, if you look at um, an angiogram, which mm-hmm. is essentially when they inject a radiographic dye into your coronary arteries... Mm-hmm. You'll see, you can see in people that even when their arteries are blocked, there's still, the blood is still somehow traveling to all the areas of the heart. Mm. And so the takeaway from that was that the heart has an extensive collateral circulation network, which it primarily relies on to get the blood everywhere. So even if you have a blocked artery, it doesn't mean that it's going to cause a heart attack. So what actually causes the heart attack is when the parasympathetic nervous system is too inactive. So in other words, what happens is the sympathetic nervous system is all kinds of activity from Mm -hmm. stress and, you know, whatever, and it causes this massive cortisol release that's just constantly going. And so when you release cortisol, it shifts your body into more of a glycolytic state, which means that it starts relying on glycogen or stored uh, sugar in your muscles. Yeah, it's breaking down glycogen. Right. And um, so over time, what that does is in the heart specifically, when you have too much sympathetic response... Um, just in general life, the way that the heart responds is if your parasympathetic activity gets too low, the metabolic activity of the heart shifts to a glycolytic pathways and the heart's not designed for that. Right. The heart is designed for, to use ketones, which Mm. are fatty acids for its fuel. So it has mechanisms to, um, that, that lie outside of ketones, but they're actually futile because Mm. what happens with glycolysis in the heart is that the heart cell uses breaks down the sugar and that creates lactic acid. Same mm-hmm. exact processes in skeletal muscle. That makes the muscle fatigued, right? The muscle gets fatigued, but in the heart it's especially important because it actually changes the pH of the heart 
and the pH change causes destruction and it prevents calcium from entering the cell because mm. the pH is different. And what that does is it causes tissue destruction. So what makes the heart take the more glycolytic path or the breaking down of stored glucose in Sympathetic the form of glycogen? Increase. Sympathetic increase. Yep. And, if and that's what most people are living in all the time. And that's why heart disease is the number one thing right now. Everyone right. stressed this industrialized modern The silent lifestyle. killer. Mm -hmm. Yep. We're worried about cancer and all this, but... You know, heart disease kills way more people than cancer on a regular. What are, what are the numbers now? Like 500,000 people uh, die in the U.S. a year? It's a lot in of In the people. United States, mm -hmm. 500,000. It's a lot of people. H how many people is there in the U.S.? Mm, I don't know, some 400 million or something like that. That's crazy. Yeah. It's a lot, man. And um, the real trouble with it is that we have... So there was a guy named Giorgio Baraldi, and uh, he studied the patho uh, the etiopathogenesis of coronary artery disease, mm. which essentially means the origin and the um, the origin of disease process, basically, mm -hmm. of coronary mm -hmm. artery, artery disease. So he looked at what are the mechanisms, and some of the conclusions of his research was peop was that even people who had a heart attack with a stenosed artery. They didn't always have a heart attack if they had a stenosed artery, even if it was like 90% closed off. Mm -hmm. They didn't always have a heart attack. So it's only 40% of people had a heart attack with a stenosed artery. Mm. So the majority of people with the blocked arteries didn't have heart attacks. And so it, it, led us, it led them to conclude that the actual cause is not the artery blockage. It doesn't help, but it's not the cause. And the mm. cause from what Cowan's uh, research says, which I think is just an interpretation of Baraldi's, was that it's the the nervous system is being out of balance, the autonomic nervous system. Mm. And so again, it goes back to anthroposophically, those two forces that are at play and which ties back into my book, which is balance. You have to have balance and that's the simplest way to look at things. Mm. So if you take balance, the concept of balance and you apply it to your life, it, it extends into there. You have to have time for relaxation. You have to have time mm. for, to rest and digest essentially. Parasympathetic. Yeah. Yep. And how do you figure that out? You have to take a good objective look at your life and say, what am I doing every day? You know, I work eight hours a day, then I come home and I, I have to deal with the stress of home life and mm -hmm. making ends meet, and I have kids to raise, and I have all this different stuff. I'm worried about my money, and there's all these different worries that we have that just keep driving the sympathetic response. And so, and there you have it, right? Disease. What's the key to bringing us into parasympathetic response? Uh, I guess it's it depends, you know? It really depends on the person. How can you best access mm -hmm. a restful state Mm. Whether it's peace of mind, vacation, or just, you know, taking a moment to yourself. I think breathing is a really good way to mm. restore the rhythms in the body. And by restoring rhythm, you also restore balance. Mm. So just a simple breathing exercises, I think they're really effective for most people. You know, if you, even if you just take one deep breath right now, it'll have a profound impact on the rest of this conversation. <laughs> I'm thoroughly Bob aligned just after that out, breath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I I 100% agree with you. Mindfulness, especially of the breath, has been one of my favorite techniques for calming myself down and allowing myself to have true rest. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes even when we sleep, we don't feel rested. But You know what? I gave you a bad answer. Yeah. <laughs> because the best way to get into parasympathetics is to go out into nature. Mm, That's the best way. Oh, man. <laughs> That's so true, man. Right? We gotta connect back into nature, and that's what you get that feeling is about, right? It is, yeah. You, and and you know what? The so air and light bathing; these are old techniques, you know. And um, air and so the the light is actually charging us. You know, we're getting energy from mm -hmm. it, and the air we're getting fresh air. You know, we're we're restoring the cells with with fresh oxygen. So many people, you know, I take the bus like every day mm -hmm. and the windows are never open. And I'm just like, God, somebody open the window, man. I'm That's just how I feel about bus. it too. I love uh, the early naturopaths. They were all about leaving your windows open at night and letting mm -hmm. the fresh air in. It's so nice. I agree. It's, it's once you get used to it, it's even during the winter. Yeah. Just a crack. It's nice. Like you know, got to have that fresh air, all that mm -hmm. dust but collecting. Nature, it's It's all about nature and reconnecting with nature. Yeah, so we've we've covered a, a lot of pretty hard hitting topics on uh, homeopathic philosophy and herbalism and how we can kind of come to a understanding of them as methods of using medicine. So a homeopathic, from what you were saying, is not you know just a dilution. It's a it's a theory of using like treats like, mm -hmm. and it could be applied to anything, hypothetically even to pharmaceuticals. 
Now, here's a, here's a really good application of homeopathic philosophy that's mm-hmm. easy to understand mm-hmm. because, again, homeopathic remedies are not the philosophy. Mm-hmm. So an interesting application of homeopathy is, and this works, I've tried it on myself mm-hmm. and whatever else. If you, get a, if you burn your finger, mm-hmm. they always say, oh, put cold water on it. But actually, you should put hot water on it and run mm-hmm. hot water on it because the hot water creates more inflammation. And so the body has a, a compensatory response to the increased inflammation, mm. which is to decrease the inflammation. Mm. And so you use like to treat like. Mm. If you have a third degree burn, please consult with your yeah. healthcare <laughs> professional before you follow this yeah, advice. Don't take a hot shower. <laughs> yeah. you burn yourself. It makes sense. Um, I think, was it one time we were hanging out, we were out in some forest area and we put our feet in a cold stream mm, I remember and I that. tend to really have cold. pretty cold feet, mm-hmm. but we left it in there for a few minutes. We're just hanging out, enjoying nature. And when we got out of that water, uh, our feet like warmed up. I was, they were sweating. like, they were warm and yeah. they were pink and everything. It's how do you put cold feet into cold water? And now they're warm. Right. Homeopath- and that, that water homeopathy, was Homeopathy. That's basically what, what that was. That's what it is. That's yeah. that philosophy. So I, that's the best way that I can explain to people mm. what homeopathy is mm. you use like to treat like and you can do it very simply without remedies right it's like focusing on how do i stimulate what they call the healing force of the body to respond to something yeah so and that theory could be applied to any kind of uh healing at all and especially with water and temperature mm. because we have rece- so the the temperature receptors that we have are are very sensitive and in particular to certain areas of the body like especially the abdomen and the stomach. You know how when you get into cold water, you can tolerate up to the waist. Yeah. And then when you get into the stomach, it starts to really start uh, to really feel vital it. organs. Yeah. <laughs> so the temperature receptors are very. Uh, it's like the first line of communication with because it's on the skin and it's the mo- our most outer organ is the skin, and they communicate um, very well with the nervous system, and so temperature specifically has a regulatory effect in that it sends information to the body and to the internal organs to carry out processes to respond to the temperature. So if if it gets too hot, the body has to cool itself by sweating. Mm. And so we're very, very sensitive to changes in temperature and we're very well equipped to deal with them as well. Mm. And so again, this concept of just using something as simple as water or different temperature water can really have a profound impact on the function of your organs. Mm. It's, it is pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. Heard of amazing things from cryotherapy where yeah, uh, someone's yep. put into, is it like uh, liquid nitrogen? Yeah, it's like, nitrogen. So it's very, very cold. It's like negative 200 Celsius it's, it's, or something. Yeah, wild. it's incredibly cold. But it's for a very short period of time. So it sends this you know shock on the body and then it adapts and the person feels better after it. I, if you jump into, I was, so, okay. So last year I was asking myself, how can I radically change my state? Mm, like, what is a good question to that, ask right? regularly? <laughs> yeah, seriously. So one <laughs> of the things that you can do is just jump into a body of cold water because your body, if the water is cold enough, it will, you will have a response that your body thinks that it's under attack and that it's it's likely to die soon if the water is cold enough. It basically is under attack by yeah, that coldness. Exactly, yeah, mm. because you're, it's a stressor. Mm. And so your, what does your body do to stress? Stress is kind of like inflammation. It's like acute inflammation. And so your body will rally against that. And that's the secondary effect, right? Mm. And so and you can do it very simply with just jumping in cold water. You know, mm. I'm not recommending that or, you know, giving advice to do that, but it's something that you could notice. I've heard um, different forms of hydrotherapy, like sauna, hot water, and also cold water and cryotherapy, speed healing processes mm-hmm. uh, and regeneration after injuries and, and things like that. Yep. It's pretty remarkable stuff, you know? And it's very simple, too. Mm. All right. So in your forays into homeopathy, have you seen any what would be called miraculous cures? Because I always hear, you know, this they took this homeopathic and just everything went away. Absolutely. I've I've had experiences with myself, but I'll I'll tell you that second because Mm -hmm. it's much more objective if I could tell you about um, a person that I treated who was a family member Mm -hmm. and you know, she was experiencing, she was in, she's in perimenopause. And so she's transitioning to menopause, which is when essentially now her estrogen levels are starting to drop. Mm -hmm. And since hormones are so important, they basically carry life processes by informing the cell to do certain things. Mm -hmm. When you have less of that information, the cells are kind of like, Hmm, they don't really know what to do. 
And so they just just be cells at that point without the, the information that they need. So with perimenopause especially, you're getting you're now entering this period of there's a lack of estrogen. And so one of the, the chief symptoms of that is a hot flash mm-hmm. because the estrogen was helping to regulate um, the circulatory system. And, and of course, one of the primary ways that we dissipate heat is through vasodilation. Mm-hmm. And, the vessels uh, dilating and yep. kind of lets the heat out. Yep, making the vessels smaller and, or bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just, you know, that was what she, her chief complaint was, this, these hot flesh. And they were really bad. You know, she was getting them every single day, hot flesh, just sweating and needs to drink ice water. And, Sticking um, her head in freezers, <laughs> yelling at people on the getting road. Getting irritable, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Blowing up on you. Mm-hmm. Ah, so I essentially just interviewed her to get an understanding of who she was more. Again, this is a family member, um, but, you know, you don't really often go into these deep conversations with family mm-hmm. members. Um, and, um, so we inter, I interviewed her and I got an understanding of what she was feeling and what she was going through. And I gave her a, a remedy that, that was seemed to be appropriate to the case. And, um, within, I think a week, she, no, it was in the, within a few days, she, so, all right. So I followed up with her like a month later. Mm-hmm. And so I said, oh, how you doing? You know, how's the hot flashes? And she's like, oh my God, I forgot about those. She's like, I'm not getting them anymore. Mm. I said, wow, that's pretty good. You're pretty <laughs> good job at this. <laughs> They're completely gone, you know, and nowhere else in the world can you find a medicine outside of homeopathic philosophy. Well, I don't know if that's true, but homeopathic remedies seem to be highly effective at that, where mm. you can you can actually eliminate symptoms and, you know, call it a cure, if you will, but... Uh, yeah, the, the hot flash just, just went away. And that was the only thing that we changed. She didn't do anything else. What uh, homeopathic did you give her? For that case, it was causticum, which is Costum. a potassium. It's a, a um, what's the name of it? Potassium something. I'll think of it it's as It's like a salt, through. potassium something salt. It's not a salt. It's actually caustic potassium or something like that. Oh, okay. Like causticum means it's some kind of potassium. I can't remember what exactly it is. but Right. What is that indicated for? Um, what well, made you give that one to her for hot flashes? Okay, well, so the hot flashes didn't necessarily... When you're taking a homeopathic case, the physical symptoms don't really take... They don't take precedence over the mental and emotional symptoms, which is more of like the astral planes and the spiritual planes. Um, so one of the keys to her case was that she was very... Um, What's the right? Oh, sensitive to injustice. Mm. So any kind of injustice that she perceived would be an injustice, she would have a reaction to that. And it wasn't to the point where, you know, if someone on the street was getting, you know, harassed, she would go over there and and do something. Not to that degree, but it was to the the degree of whoever she's, you know, friends with or an acquaintance, she'll stand up for them if she feels like they're being, you know, treated lesser. And so that's a major keynote for causticum. Mm. And not many other remedies have that that symptom. So... Or trait, I should say. In homeopathic theory, it's not that this homeopathic preparation is for hot flashes. It's more this homeopathic medicine is for this overall constellation of symptoms where uh, one of them is like indignation. Sounds good to injustice. To injustice. But it's a holistic medicine. So just because I have that one symptom, and I see this a lot where it's like, oh, you know, the person uh, doesn't like their throat to be touched. It must be this remedy, but that's only one symptom though. You know, there's multiple remedies associated with multiple symptoms, or Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, there's multiple remedies associated with the same symptom. Mm. And so the more specific you can get, the better chances you are of finding a very, the most similar remedy essentially. How did early homeopaths discover what these medicinal properties of these substances were? So Samuel Hahnemann in, you know, back in like the 1800s, I think early 1800s or something, he was trying to figure out how to so at that time there was a big uh, malarial outbreak Mm -hmm. back when infectious diseases were epidemic and um, so he was trying to figure out essentially how he could cure uh, malaria so what he noticed was that when they were giving like mercury and things like that to try and combat the malaria and uh, and that wasn't really effective at at helping people it was just symptom management it was heroic medicine as they call it Mm -hmm. Um, so he kind of did some explorations with uh, this this uh, plant called chincona, which is a um, it's a bark from a tree. 
So mm-hmm. it's also referred to as China. And um, it's the first, that was the first homeopathic remedy that they, that he figured out. Is that the bark that uh, quinine exactly. is extracted from? That yep. uh, flavoring in tonic water that's used in gin and tonics. Yep, and it's a poison too. Mm-hmm. So what he found was that by taking, for some reason, I, like I don't know what the whole story was, I don't think anyone does, but mm-hmm. he just took it. Like he took the chincona bark in a low mm-hmm. dose, so he diluted it. And then he, he noticed that the symptoms that he had were similar to malaria. Mm-hmm. And so, again, this is really weird that someone would do that. But <laughs> he did that and he noticed that he was getting the same effect. So then he said, hmm, if I give this to a person who has those symptoms, what would, what would happen? And so he was giving this remedy to people with remarkable success. You know, they would take the remedy and then he'd notice through careful observation, very, very meticulous person, he would notice, he would log all the symptoms, how they changed, when they changed, what changed exactly, and he would write all this stuff down, and he noticed that with a lot of people, he was curing malaria, Mm. just by using a remedy that would cause those symptoms. Right, so he took it, it caused all the symptoms of malaria, so he kind of had a little bit of a intuitive revelation or something, where he's like, well, maybe if I take it, or maybe if I give it to somebody with malaria, it'll heal malaria, Mm -hmm. and it ended up being a really effective agent for malaria, correct? And yeah, and, and what they do now, there's a that process is somewhat standardized. It's how do you figure out, let's just say me and you, you know, went and took a leaf from a tree mm-hmm. and said, oh, this is a poisonous leaf. What does it do? You know, what, what will it do if we actually ate it? Mm-hmm. We would have like nausea, vomiting. We'd have some weird nervous symptoms maybe. And maybe we would become more aggressive, right? That's what would happen if we took the poison. So you can get that same effect on the person by repeated doses of the homeopathic version of it, which is the more dilute version. So you're giving your body this repeated assault of energetic medicine, which is causing the aggravation we talked about. So the person then adopts those symptoms, and they're temporary. They don't last forever. They only last for a certain period of time, depending on how, how potent the dose is. And so what they do is they all those people who take their medicine will write down everything that they're experiencing. And so they say, you know, on Tuesday I had a sore throat, it felt like it was something in my throat. On Wednesday, I had diarrhea on Thursday and so on. And they write all these symptoms down. And then the person who's conducting the study takes all of the, uh, the, the patient's logs and mm-hmm. all their information, and he looks for similarities in the, the process. So mm-hmm. it's a very meticulous process to be able to figure out what the remedy does. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot of work. You have to look through all this stuff. And these things are sometimes 250 pages of, of material. If you look at approving of uh, positronium, which is actually antimatter that they extracted from uh, um, these weird experiments they were doing with, with um, particle accelerators. Mm-hmm. If you, at a particle accelerator, you basically speed up two particles mm-hmm. and you let them collide with each other. And then what that does is it splits them into smaller particles and some of it's radiation because you can't see it. Right, and positrons are the positively charged equivalents of electrons, right? I Which believe, are negatively well, charged. I don't know, actually, or is that because something different? that's a proton, right? Kind of. Protons have mass, though. Protons and heavier. neutrons have mass. Electrons don't really have yeah, mass. I think they're, like, actually the counterpart of them. Okay, so whatever, whatever it correctly. is, it's a weird... Who knows? It's Man, another physics particle. physics is something... <laughs> It's amazing. Yeah. It's so but it's yeah. not matter though because okay. where electrons and protons are matter because you can apparently see them or something, I don't know. But if you <laughs> crash two physical protons together, you get radiation which mm-hmm. is antimatter because it's not because it's not a physical particle. It's Got all it, yeah. but it's just so electromagnetic. Um, in the same way that infrared light is not mm-hmm. physical, but it's there you can see it with infrared goggles. So the positronium, anti, it's a very interesting proving of the, what, what people were saying about it when they wrote down their stuff. and um, But the proving is like 250 pages long. You know? <laughs> so homeopathy is, is not for the, um, the faint of heart. Yeah, not for the faint of heart at all, man. Yeah, so who have been some of your most influential teachers of homeopathy? Who has inspired you the most? Okay, so... I'll tell you quickly my story with it because that sort of ties into this. Mm-hmm. So when I started at NUNM in my first year, I'd come in with kind of a history of getting like recurrent common cold. You know, I remember several, I remember that. Yeah. Year, yeah. And that was my picture at that time. Mm-hmm. And it was really annoying. It was like one of my biggest fears going into medical school was getting sick all the time and dealing with the workload and also not being able to get enough sleep. So 
sure enough, you know, I go and within like the first few months, I had wound up getting this, um, this like weird viral illness where it was like, it was a cold, but not really because, you know, in the first week I'd have symptoms of a cold, really bad sore throat and, you know, a headache or whatever else. And then, you know, a week later, I would get better. And then the next week, I'd be worse again. And this was going on for six weeks, you know, which is a long time. It's a, it's a month and a half. And I'm in school. I'm dealing with all this stuff. And I started to notice that I was also getting a little bit emotionally labile. Mm-hmm. I was starting to get upset when the symptoms came back. Like mood swings, things yep. like that. I was starting to get really upset when... And it, it didn't help that I was getting woken up at like 3 a.m. with just a terrible sore throat. Mm-hmm. It's like I couldn't swallow. And so I get up. Um, you know, and I just was like, I don't know what to do with myself because I couldn't sleep. I was just frustrated with everything. Nothing was working. The only thing that was working actually was aspirin. And Mm. I don't like to use anything when I'm sick, any drugs of any kind, but it was the only thing that would allow me to get to sleep. So, but one day I was like, I'm not taking aspirin. Like, I'm just going to deal with this. It was like three o'clock in the morning. And I just decided to start reading, um, Nature Cure, which was uh, Henry, Henry Lindlar's book, which was a one of the pioneering books in naturopathic medicine. Right. He, uh, for our listeners who don't know about nature care, it's essentially the the philosophical backbone of naturopathic medicine mm-hmm. and all these theories of like treats like and uh, healing crises, how when you give a medicine, it actually causes a reaction at first and all these uh, holistic ideas outline. So it's a great book. It's available for free online. I mm-hmm. highly recommend it. Yeah, it really was. It, I didn't get any information from the book that that uh, pushed me directly into homeopathy. It mm-hmm. more so was inspiration that I used to say, when I picked up the book, this is what I thought to myself. Mm-hmm. There has to be something in this book that can help me. Mm. And that's the thought that I had. And so I just was reading it and I started reading about these different observations that Linlar wrote about. And I was like, wow, this is all very interesting stuff. You know, I never thought about any of this. And so that was kind of the inspiration for me to go and pursue more avenues. It gave me the courage to pursue more avenues of self-healing mm. and how I could get rid of this damn thing I had for six weeks. I went to the regular doctor. They were like, oh, it's a viral illness. I was just like, all right, well, I already knew that. You know, like, is there anything I could do? There was nothing, so it was of course. a waste. Yeah. <laughs> just as a, a side side thing, a lot of modern conventional medicine, that's all it does. It can tell you what's wrong with you, but it really has no idea how to even treat the cold. Right, and it has its it has good use, just like my aspirin. You know, it helped right. me get to sleep, but it wasn't able. They weren't able to help me resolve anything essentially. Right. So the the whole healing part of the medicine, it's just so, sometimes lacking. Yeah, it's almost actually absent. Because it's not, they're strictly deal with, with pathology, which is right. just disease. And symptoms. Right? And symptoms, yeah. Mm-hmm. Expression of disease. It's an understandable route to take, you know, because somebody comes in, they have this and that symptom, you want to help them not have the symptoms. So essentially the whole science has been formed around how do I get rid of the symptoms as fast as possible. Right. And it's become incredibly effective at that, mm-hmm. which has its own place. But of course, we're talking about healing here. We're not talking about temporary relief of symptoms. We're, We're talking about getting rid things. of this thing and it's no longer there. Yeah. So, and that's exactly what happened. So here's the rest of the story. Mm-hmm. So we weren't exposed to homeopathy yet. We'd never learned anything about it. Right. And honestly, I have no idea how I found, like, how I stumbled into it. But I was just like on the computer one day and just reading about homeopathy. And I had come across a few remedies and I had noticed that every time, this was another really annoying thing. Every time I went to lay down at night, I would just get a dry cough and it was to the point where like it just kept going and everybody was every time I laid down only when I laid down and I couldn't fall asleep because every time I laid down I had to cough and when I did fall asleep I would get up coughing at like you know four in the morning and then have to really try and like grin and bear it and go back to sleep mm-hmm. so it was and then in the morning I would have a wet cough with yellow mucus and this was every night and every morning and so I was like hmm this is very odd so then when I, in my research, I beginner's luck is what it was. I had stumbled across pulsatilla, which one of the major keynotes is dry cough at night and wet cough with yellow mucus in the morning. And so I was like, all right, I have that. And then it was sore throat, which favors the right side, I believe, which I had. And then the mental emotional component was, you know, very weepy, very sad, uh, very emotional. And I had all those symptoms. 
And so I just decided that day, I was like, okay, I have this remedy that I just bought uh, randomly from like for uh, one of our classes. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then I took it and I didn't notice anything that day. And then when I went home, when I got home, I was really frustrated. And I was like, you know what? Like I'm taking as much of this. So I just took a bunch of different, I took like uh, two different doses of it. And I just took uh, like multiple pellets. And then I went to sleep. And then the next day when I woke up, everything was gone. Wow. It, yep. And it never came back. And I felt physically, I felt lighter. That's the only way I can describe it. I was in a better mood. I felt lighter. All my symptoms were gone. And that, whatever that thing was, it mm. just never returned. And so I felt that I owed it to homeopathy to study it and to practice it. And that's where I'm at today. And so along that path, I spent a lot of time with self-learning intentionally because I wanted to uh, learn my own way of doing things and interpret it from my own way as an individual without getting trapped in somebody else's dogma. Mm. Because I figured this is the way that you, you advance medicine is by coming up with your own ideas, you know? So to this day, I've relied largely on my own insights, my own findings, my own research, my own studies, essentially, and the integration of the two major teachers that I had um, just by reading their work, which was Rajan Sankaran from India and George Vithulkas from Greece. So I have an indo gresian understanding of homeopathy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and Dr. Zorn, Dr. Matt Zorn, who practices um, here in Portland, he was a really good, he's, he gives really good advice, mm -hmm. you know, and I, because I reached out to him at a certain point where I didn't feel like I was on solid ground after doing all self-study with it, because there's a lot, you know, and it's a whole other thing. And so I reached out to Dr. Zorn. I was like, hey, can you help me out? You know, I'm not sure where to go with this. And he, you know, he, he took the time out of the day to meet me in the library and he showed me all of his books and we talked about health and disease. And, you know, I asked him like, what is health, you know? And he gave me his interpretation. And from that day forward, I was like, okay, like I like this book, I like this book, I'm gonna use these books. And so I stuck with, I picked the Sankaran book mm -hmm. and that was the one that I got from him. And then somehow I stumbled across Vithulkas who is, both guys very, very accomplished. Vithulkas has multiple lifetime achievement awards for homeopathy. Rajan Sankaran is the son of a famous homeopath in India who developed his own system of homeopathy. And, um, and there's that dogma again that I was trying to avoid with Vithulkas is, has been largely critical of Sankaran because of the way Sankaran practices homeopathy, <laughs> which is so stupid. They're both getting excellent results. So what's the big deal, man? Egos, you know? man. It's right? the ego, yeah. Has it's the be. ego. But Vithulkas, they both have really good ways of practicing homeopathy. Vithulkas is more Hahnemann style, classic, and Rajan is more of what he calls the sensation method, which is trying to understand what the cause energetically is of the patient. And the mm. way that you do that is by assessing the main feeling. Mm. So in other words, my main feeling with the pulsatilla was this, um, this weepiness and this emotional, um, you know, lability which is central to that remedy. Mm. And um, the physical symptoms were confirmatory, but actually the main feeling of pulsatilla is, is being forsaken. And um, so essentially you, you feel like uh, you've been abandoned by someone and you mm. get emotional about it and, and you do all these other compensatory mechanisms in response. Mm. So Rajan Sankaran, uh, George Vithulkas, and Samuel Hahnemann, if you're going to study homeopathy, Everything that you need to know is in Organon. The Organon of the medical art is, was Hahnemann's book. Mm. And it, it spells out everything you need to know about homeopathy. It's just that nobody reads it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Vithulkas did a really good job of laying out the scientific understanding of homeopathy when it comes to um, dilutions and how you choose a potency, how you, how you choose to dose, how you manage the case. And Sankaran just is a really good understanding of how to how to apply remedies conceptually. Mm. And so I have, on the one hand, a really good conceptual mentor, and on the other hand, a really good scientific mentor when it comes to homeopathy. If you put those two things together, you get a really good system of, of using homeopathy with a background in, in Hahnemann's work. Absolutely. Now, for our listeners who are interested in learning more about uh, homeopathy and learning how to... Uh, take remedies for themselves and their loved ones. Is there mm -hmm. any resources you'd recommend? Um, I don't recommend that people try and take it themselves because it's mm -hmm. complicated and it requires meticulous study and assimilation of a lot of information. Mm -hmm. And it's very abstract and it's also very practical too. 
you know, there's guys like Boricky and Boninghausen who focused more exclusively on the physical symptoms, mm -hmm. you know, diarrhea and odd, peculiar, whatever of the throat, not so much on the mental, emotional planes. And that was probably because at that time, infectious disease was the main problem. And so people had all kinds of physical complaints. But now we're very psychologically active with computers, with all the technology that we use. We have a lot of psychic stimulation. Mm -hmm. And what do you get? It's like an overactivity of the psyche. And so you see a lot of disease manifestations in the mental state mm -hmm. and in the emotional plane. And so it, you'd be hard pressed to find someone who has a physical problem that doesn't accompany a, a chronic mental problem as well, mm -hmm. like a chronic trauma or something like that, emotional trauma. I, you know, I, I was, um, had helped out a girl who she had ovarian cancer and it, you know, it went away and she's, she was with this guy that she was engaged to marry and you know, she kind of had these insights of uh, the fact that her relationship could be contributing to her health. And, you know, as it turned out, the relationship was very toxic for her. Mm. And we kind of explored some of that. And, um, and my opinion was that the, the, that relationship was driving her illness, mm. you know, and, you know, several, so she broke off her engagement and several months later, her, you know, she didn't have any signs of ovarian cancer anymore. Wow. So it, it's really interesting stuff. The, the mental emotional plane is extremely powerful. And again, it's those um, astral spirit and, um, or I'm sorry, yeah, the astral soul and the spirit ego forces, which are shaping everything from top down and are giving instructions to the lower forces on how to assemble themselves. And so if you have, you know, this information that's um, essentially deleterious in some way, well, that's the result you're going to get in the physical body. And so you have that imbalance of forces again. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much again for uh, coming on the show. This is a very thought-inspiring and heart-moving conversation. Mm -hmm. How can our friends and listeners acquire more information about you or what you're up to? Do you have an Instagram page? Do you have a website? You can only meet me in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> That's where all the real people meet. But just in case they live indoors. <laughs> um, What's your Instagram handle? It's just my name. It's just Jared Pistoia. Jared Pistoia. Yeah, I'm not too active on it. I really try to uh, be more plugged into the physical world, you know, because of there's so there's many different ways of engaging with technology and being and having an online presence. But I don't really, it's not really enjoyable for me to be on those, those avenues. But I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm on Instagram. I'm also on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I don't really check them. I don't check Facebook that often. But Instagram, you can connect with me on Instagram. Um, I post, you know, several videos and such. But uh, I would say if, if you want to connect with me, you should probably go to LinkedIn. and Just search for my name. And how do you spell your last name? P-I-S. T is in Tom. O-I-A. Excellent. Pistoia. So find my man Jared Pistoia out in the hallways of NUNM or catch him on the street <laughs> because he's not too much about social media, but he is about truth as we've seen today. That's right, baby. Uh, so this has been the Herbal Hour, Sip and Tea, talking about herbalism, philosophy, homeopathy, all the good things. You can follow me at naturopathic.life on Instagram. And if you want to follow me on uh, Facebook, my personal account is Boggy Dan. Thank you guys for listening. Take care and enjoy your evening.